Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. Hi, everyone. Hey, everyone. <clears throat> That's an easier way for me to break the ice. So, um, <laughs> hi, welcome. Thank you all so much for being here. It's amazing to see so many people and some people that I know, I see you back there, and some people that I don't know, which is so exciting. Um, yeah, thank you for being here. If you don't know who I am, I'm Sarah Bellareed. Well, I'm Ryan Gaston. Um, and we are, let me get something up on the screen, hang tight. And we are finding Kino. Ah. We are here today to share with you um, a little bit about an instrument that we have. This is so woofy. Can I do something to make it better? Sorry about my breath sounds. OK, we're here to share with you a little bit about an instrument that we've been building over the last five or six years called Migsy, uh, which we will talk all about and explain what it is and how it works, and also, in general, how to kind of how we approach what I was just doing, which is connecting acoustic instruments to modular synthesizers and to Max MSP. So, yeah. let's go. <laughs> Are you ready? You ready? Oh, okay. We'll, we'll do a Q&A at the end, um, so, so know that. If you have any really kind of like burning questions uh, that you feel can't wait, raise your just hand. Just let us know. Yeah, and, and if there's something you're just like really not getting or we breeze past something way too quickly, it's totally fine to interject and ask us to, to recap something. If you think that it's not something super important immediately, then, then we can answer other questions at the end. But we're both really nerdy about all this stuff, so <laughs> it's easy to get uh, a little, little too far ahead too quickly. Uh, anyway, so we're going to talk about broadly um, our approach for working with augmented acoustic instruments. Uh, but to address what that even means, I wanted first to kind of explain how we think of the categorization of different types of electronic instruments. Uh, there, do you know the name of the Miranda and Wanderley paper by chance? It's a book. Oh, a book. Um, if you know, and I computer music controllers or digital music controllers, something like that. If you Googled Miranda and Wanderley 2006, it would come up, especially <laughs> if you, you put go. it into Google Scholar, which is a nice yeah. tip. Yeah, I can't remember the exact name. But. Anyway, these rather brilliant pre people who have been in uh, kind of the field of instrument design for, for a while broke things down into four categories for electronic instruments. So the first type of electronic instrument is an instrument-like gestural controller. And I guess really they're talking about controllers mostly, more so than... They are. They're talking about digital music controllers. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so instrument-like gestural controllers are electronic devices that model the workflow of a, a traditional instrument and really do so expressly for the purpose of doing the same kinds of thing the original instrument would do. Are we okay with sound? Okay, cool. Um, 
so th these instruments here, for instance, uh, one is an electronic harpsichord, uh, one is a Morrison E trumpet, the other is a Zanzithophone, which is a kind of like <laughs> weird saxophone-like thing. Um, it's on Neutral Milk Hotel's music a lot if you want to hear what a Zanzithophone is like, super weird. Um, but anyway, really they are like for the purpose of behaving like the instrument itself would behave. The next category is an instrument-inspired gestural controller, which kind of takes inspiration from the way that a traditional instrument works, but to the end of doing things more than what that instrument would be able to do. So things like the Buchla Marimba Lumina or an Eigen Harp that use something like a normal instrument's user interface and would be approachable to players of that instrument but do more than just the average marimba or bassoon. Next, there are alternate gestural controllers, and these are pretty common to us as electronic musicians. Um, these are devices that aren't necessarily modeled off of a traditional instrument directly and are meant for controlling and playing electronic sound. So things like a push or the Buchla Thunder um, in this, uh, on the sensible overlay, and um, those are Perry's conches, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those are Perry Cook's conch controllers. <laughs> uh, so not necessarily something that has been used for traditional music in the past, something that kind of seeks to make new types of music available with new user interfaces. And then the fourth Miranda and Wanderley category is augmented musical instruments, um, which is basically a device that takes an actual acoustic instrument add sensors to it so that you can still have the performance of the real instrument, but then add stuff to it. Um, whenever we met, we were both interested in kind of pursuing the development of augmented musical instruments because we were both uh, acoustic instrumentalists that were kind of starting to branch into electronic music. Uh, we're both trumpet players. Um, at the point that we met, I was already kind of tired of playing trumpet and uh, was dealing with electronics more exclusively. And Sarah had more of a drive to kind of find a way to bring the two worlds together. And it seemed to make sense that making an augmented trumpet could be a cool way to do that. Yes, I agree. Anyway. Um, yeah, so that was, yeah, a great introduction to kind of, um, the different types of instrument categories, and then the one obviously that we focused on was the last, the augmented acoustic instrument. Um, so at the time that we started thinking about this, um, I'm just gonna walk you through a couple of the things that we did so that you could do them. A lot of the questions I get asked are like, that's great, but how do I even start thinking about designing my own augmented instrument or my own computer music controller? if you're more interested in one of those other categories. Um, so I just wanna make sure that all of you are aware of this conference, and I'm not like endorsed by them or anything, called NIME, which is the New Interfaces for Musical Expression. Um, their website is just, I believe it's just nime.org. Um, the reason why I want you to know about this is because it's a gathering that happens, it's an academic conference that happens every year in a different place around the world and people who are working and doing research in this area, designing you know, new instruments, new controllers, doing studies about this stuff all come together and share their research and it's a really interesting time. Um, and what's great about it is that all of the proceedings, so all of the articles that get published as a result of the conference are free. They're not behind a paywall, so they're things that you can download and you can access and you can, even if you can't be there in person, you can benefit from all of this amazing research. So what we did <laughs> was we basically went into, then deep into the NIME archives, um, which are very deep, and we looked around for all kinds of you know, articles about augmented instruments. And we started to find dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens. And then what you realize is that all of your brilliant ideas have probably been explored in some way by someone else. And the knee-jerk reaction is maybe to get a little bit depressed by that, but let me tell you that that is the best thing ever. Because it means that someone has done a lot of the hard work, you know, someone has already kind of gone in there and tried some things out. So now what you get to do is learn from them, not reinvent the wheel. You know, a lot of these nine papers are like 
really direct technical breakdowns of how they accomplished the things that they were trying to do. Mm -hmm. So you can replicate that and then keep going. And so that's exactly what we did. Um, this is just a nice example of what you would be like, what you would be experiencing if you were scrolling <laughs> through the infinite Nime archive. It really is infinite too. Even one year of proceedings is a lot yeah. of information. So there, there's cool stuff. So uh, there's plenty of other resources out there, but Nime in particular, if I had to leave you with just one, it would be the one for, for this topic. So out of that amazing archive, we came across um, a number of, p of researchers who had been directly working with augmented trumpets. Um, there are more than this, but again, these are the people who chose to publish their work in an academic setting, so it's definitely not everybody. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of these in detail tonight because we just don't have enough time, but if anyone's curious about this, you can snap a photo, as I see someone's doing, snap a photo of the slide or just email us and I'll send you the links, that's fine too. Um, the thing in particular is that all of these trumpet controllers were very, um, I guess, gear heavy. They really involved like putting a lot of new stuff on the trumpet, lots of new bells and whistles, lots of things, modifying the trumpet permanently, except for one of them, which is this one, the easily removable optical sensing system, which was developed by some wonderful folks at the University of Victoria in Canada. Um, and uh, we were really drawn to this because we were both trumpet players. I was coming from a classical trumpet background and I did not want to drill holes into my trumpet. I, was, I wanted to do something that could come on and off for one show one night and then the next show I could be you know, playing classical music with an opera and not ha be like have this weird Frankenstein trumpet, right? So we were inspired by this. So that became the kind of the base of what we did. And then we continued and we just developed what we called MIGSY. Do you wanna, or should I keep going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so this is kind of the, the, the rough mock-up of what MIGSY would eventually be like, which is currently like that. Uh, so basically, MIGSY's pretty dang simple. So really, there are only a few sensors. Um, Beneath each of the trumpet's valves, there's an infrared emitter and detector pair that it's basically uh, serves to act as, a pro act as a proximity detector. So basically we have the ability to detect at any given moment how depressed all of the valves are, which is different from some prior work that was really just trying to tell whether a valve was depressed or not. So you get like binary information from the valves rather than continuous information from the valves, uh, which is important and we'll get to that later. Uh, there's also an accelerometer that senses roughly the orientation of the instrument and how quickly it's moving at any given time. And there are four sensing resistors on either side of the valve casing where you hold the instrument with your left hand, which gives us a kind of crude but effective way to detect uh, the tension of the hand that's holding the instrument. Uh, which is pretty cool because that is uh, kind of a parameter of playing the trumpet that has nothing to do with what the trumpet sounds like, but it's something that definitely changes as you play it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of became a running theme with how we used all this stuff. Yeah. So, um, anyway. as you probably gathered if you read the, the, the long form of the name MIGSY, it actually stands for Minimally Invasive Gesture Sensing Interface, which is... Um, we just call her Migsy, though, it's, our, you know. Um, but basically, again, we were really interested in this idea of designing something that could come on and off of the horn and could be removable. So the minimally invasive, although like weird technical terms, it was really for the sake of the acronym. <laughs> um, we were just interested in something small, portable, and removable that wouldn't cause damage to the horn. Um, and another thing, before I move on, in case anyone's wondering, where do force sensitive resistors and infrared optical sensors come from? Great question. Places like sparkfun.com or Adafruit um, are two retailers where you can buy all of these sensors. They will even, you can get kits, um, you can get all kinds of things, and they have free, great free tutorials online about how to, once you get that sensor, what to do with it so that you can actually make it work. There's free code snippets um, that you can copy and paste and put into your, um, your coding environments that so you can get started. And then from there, you can kind of, you know, pretty, pretty quickly 
start to realize what does what, you know, just change that number, change that thing there. That's how we learned. <laughs> and break it all and then delete it and put the sample code back in and try again. And then you start to kind of learn how it works. So I think that's a really important thing to say because a lot of the time this seems very mysterious, but really these tools are a couple cents to a couple dollars each. And they're things that you could all go home and buy today if you wanted. So, okay. Um, oh, and if you're also uh, a little bit of a bookworm and you want to read our contribution to the NIME archive, <laughs> you can look up the title Minimally Invasive Gesture Sending Interface in NIME 2016, and you'll find our paper, which talks all about how MIGSI works. And there is another one, too. It was published. Oh, there's another one from 2019. 2019. So two, two papers yeah, out there. Yeah, which has to do with like mapping reading. strategies. Okay. So before we, we're going to make some more sound in a few minutes, but before we do that, I wanted to just kind of re-emphasize the main design considerations that were went into building this instrument. Um, because there are things that I think are very useful for you to ponder and ask yourself and challenge yourself with if you find yourself making, you know, your own com computer music controller, if you, or, you know, if you're augmenting your own instruments or anything like that. So number one, and that doesn't mean you need to take our design considerations, but just to kind of have that critical mind and, and ask yourself these questions. So number one for us was playability. It sounds obvious, but what we meant by playability was that both the interface, the controller part, and the trumpet were playable. So it was really important to us that we weren't going to do something to the trumpet that made the acoustic side of the trumpet no longer the beautiful, expressive, um, facile instrument that it is, right? So that was really important. Well, and similarly, we didn't want to put any electronics on the trumpet that would require so much attention to use that you couldn't still play the trumpet at the same time. It's all too easy to kind of slap a bunch of buttons and knobs on an instrument and get preoccupied with playing buttons and knobs and forget that the instrument's even there. Totally, yes. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I mean, trumpet players are very brilliant people, but we can only, <laughs> I'm joking, so we can only handle so much at one time. Playing an instrument, as you all know, I'm, if you have ever played an instrument before, which I have a feeling you have, it takes a lot, right? It takes a lot of concentration. And then you now all of a sudden you've just tripled, quadrupled what you're supposed to be doing on your instrument. There is going to be some cognitive overload if you're not mindful about how you're doing that. Um, Okay, so second thing was removable. We've definitely talked about that. And the third thing was expert technique. And this really ties into playability, but what we, what we were getting at here was that it would, the interface would be designed in such a way that it would leverage the technique that we already had on the trumpet, as opposed to requiring us to create a new technique. Um, so at that point in time, I had been studying trumpet you know, classically trained for, since I was like knee high to a grasshopper. <laughs> and I wanted to still be able to buzz around on the horn and have those gestures be extractable as meaningful data, either as control voltage into a modular synth or as some kind of meaningful um, data in my computer or something like that. I didn't, so you'll notice if you look at MIGSI and if we look back at that, this slide, um, Almost everything that's there is using gestures that are inherent to playing the trumpet already. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's no extra knobs or buttons that I have to push. There's a little bit of an exception with these FSRs, these hand pressure sensors on either side, but I already have to hold the trumpet, so my hand's already there. So we were using like pre-existing techniques, basically, mm -hmm. um, as data sources. Switch over I'm going to jump out of here. Okay, so we spent a while kind of making this instrument. Uh, really, at first, we were just kind of Oops. hoping that we could get some numbers to move around in a terminal on the screen and like weren't thinking too much about what the music was going to sound like uh, because we were like kind of in over our heads and had no idea what we were doing at the time. Uh, so once we kind of hit that point of success and we saw, you know, in, in the, the, the Arduino monitor that the numbers are in fact moving in the way that we expect they should be moving, 
uh, we were faced with the challenge of like actually figuring out what any of it was good for, um, <laughs> which is a big challenge and, and mm. a long challenge. Mm -hmm. We didn't think about it too much before because we realized that we were going to encounter variables that, um, that we couldn't possibly predict. So whenever, whenever we finally did get it working, we kind of started making a simple set of tools so that we would be able to kind of somewhat quickly iterate on ideas. So I'm personally most comfortable out of the various audio coding environments. I'm most comfortable with Max MSP. It's pretty dang approachable as far as these things go. And it's very easy to kind of get up and running very quickly. So if you want to start in the world of like, kind of doing your own computer music stuff, uh, strongly recommend checking it out. Um, anyway, so our first approach was just to make a really simple max patch that could take the data from the various sensors on the trumpet, scale them to be in the same range as one another, and make that data kind of arbitrarily usable within the software. Uh, there was no consideration as of yet whether it, what that data would control. Uh, really, we were just kind of figuring out what the data was was able to do and what it was good for. <laughs> um, so what that meant in the beginning is that we initially started doing all of our performances with MIGSY kind of uh, musical piece by piece. Um, so that is to say, for every single new piece we would create with MIGSY, we made a completely new patch. Mm -hmm. Um, which worked fine. We got some really good results out of it, I think, but it wasn't the most gratifying thing musically to say, okay, oh, I have an idea for how something could work, and then have to put in the work for a couple weeks before you <laughs> could actually hear it do something in like a satisfying way. It's kind of a pain to have that huge window of time between having the idea and actually executing the idea. So after a while, we got kind of sick of, of doing things in that way and decided that we needed a more general purpose application that could serve as an environment for more open-endedly and more rapidly exploring these ideas. Another thing, if I can just jump in, yeah, yeah. another thing that really propelled us toward developing this like multi-purpose app that Ryan's gonna talk about is that I, Per, per, as the main user of MIGSY, I was craving the ability to just have the experience of like sitting down at the piano and playing, you know? And that was not possible because we had to wire up the trumpet and then somehow have, what was, is everything okay? Oh, cool. <laughs> okay, as long as it's, I can, okay. Um, and then we had to, I had to, we had to somehow like, dream up the full piece before, and then to Ryan's point, go and like code it and create it and then come back. So it, the, the compositional process and the creative process was really wonky. Um, you know, it, it, we really just wanted to be able to sit down and play and like have the music happen and then be like, oh, that's cool. I'm gonna, you know, okay, I'm gonna now connect these and now I'm gonna tweak that over, like a little bit. And just that process is really like what we wanted to get yeah. into. Oh, yeah. Back over to you, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, so we kind of looked at the other parts of our personal practice to see like where we were able to get to that kind of like improvisational fluidity. And the answer for us is that we, at that point, were already both users of modular synthesizers. Uh, and modular synthesizers are very, they're not so great for some things, but they're very, very good at being able to very quickly put an idea together and kind of see how it plays out. Once you have kind of your personal setup put together and you have tools there that are inspiring to you and make sense to you, you can really sit down and like put together a whole idea or a whole piece in a very short amount of time, which is not always true in the computer music world. So we thought, okay, cool, how can we make it such that we approach these sensors on the trumpet as if they're modules? So we kind of started building this um, essentially semi-modular modular application in Max uh, that eventually grew to be kind of a gnarly thing. Um, let me, oh, it's really weird seeing the kind of keynote version of it with the actual app open at the same time. So this is the application that we use for handling data from MIGSY now. Uh, it was definitely much more skeletal at the beginning, but uh, this is what it looks like today. 
uh, over the course of you know several years of, of messing with this thing. Um, so a kind of rough idea of the workflow here, just so you can kind of see what we're doing with all this stuff. Data in this application starts in this window here. So if you look here, we have this kind of approximation of what the trumpet valves look like. We have information from each of the valves coming in here, information from the FSRs here, information from the accelerometer here, and then we have some basic tools for like processing that information in different ways. Oh, yeah, do your thing. Okay, now it's real information. So you can cool. see those numbers moving and the valves moving. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. That was our first magic uh, trick. Uh, of yeah, the well, no, that was, that was kind of one of the first wow moments. That was honestly, when we first, just to, just, oh my gosh, I can't even explain. Like when we first got that to happen, I think I sat there for like four days straight, just like, look at the wiggle, they just go, and they just go, oh my gosh. Yeah, it was, it's real. Okay, anyway. anyway so. <laughs> So I'm going to turn it back off again. Generally, like when setting up a piece or a performance from MIGZ, we don't spend a lot of time in this window. This is really just about getting, uh, getting the sensors calibrated and set up to kind of produce all the data that you're going to use in the other parts of the application. So I'll go ahead. I'll leave that open. Why not? This window here is kind of where the majority of the action happens. Um, this uh, kind of was our general purpose synthesis environment. So we decided basically, okay, cool, if we have this general purpose way of handling the data from the valves and the FSRs and whatnot, we really should build a general purpose set of tools for handling all of that so that we can, you know, at a moment's notice, uh, you know, start making sound uh, without having to rely on having external gear or any of that other stuff. So over time, we just kind of came up with a few different synthesis methods we really liked, made our own versions of those ideas, plopped them all into the app, and made it where you could interface all of these things together. The way that interfacing works is essentially the same way it works in a modular synthesizer. You know, there aren't any patch cables in this application, but there are a series of menus kind of scattered across the screen, which are themselves a type of modulation matrix that's just distributed across the, the user interface. So all of the information from MIGSI itself comes into this bus over here, and you can kind of select what the individual sources for that bus are, and you can, s oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That, that's so, a great question. Yeah, we should restate the question. Uh, yeah, so uh, the question was whether, you know, you see these valves moving around on the screen, um, how does the computer know what note is being played? Because on a trumpet, any given fingering could, could be a, a lot of different notes. Um, and the answer is that it, it doesn't know what note we're playing. <laughs> um, and in fact, that was an intentional choice. We, we haven't really attempted any kind of pitch tracking uh, or anything of that sort for this application because we worried that it would lead us too much into territory where the electronics are just kind of like mimicking what the trumpet does. Whereas what we are more interested in is kind of seeing the, the physical activity of the trumpet player and using that to generate information the computer can use to determine how active its sound should be or how kind of calm its sound should be. <clears throat> so it's really less about noticing pitches or noticing specific rhythms than it is about noticing the overall energy of the performer or yeah, yeah kind of extrapolating that yeah. in a number of different totally. ways. Totally, and that was just an uh, artistic choice that we made at the beginning. I mean, it's perfectly fascinating to do pitch, pitch, tra 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 pitch tracking work. Um, but actually, for the first couple of years working with MIGSI, we weren't even using amplification at all. So mm -hmm. the original design of MIGSI was um, was created in such a way that it didn't rely on any kind of wires or amplification so that I could be in the middle of nowhere and as long as I had my laptop near me, I could play, I could use MIGSI. So I didn't need to have a, a microphone and like a, you know, loudspeaker setup. Um, and so it was, it's really interesting that 
because so synthesis, sound synthesis was our primary focus, and you extracting gestures from the trumpet in order to interact with and manipulate the synthesis and modulate it, um, as opposed to things that you might think about when you're when you're adding electronics onto an acoustic instrument, which is processing the sound of the acoustic instrument um, and doing things like that with the actual audio input. We didn't do that intentionally until about four years into the development of MIGSI. Um, and then we did, and it was awesome, and now, and now we've <laughs> merged those worlds, but we, we very, very intentionally forced ourselves to not start there because, again, as Ryan said, we were just personally worried that it would kind of pigeonhole us a little bit, and we wanted to see what we could do with extracting the physical gestures. Um, yeah, turning that into music. Yeah, I hope that answers the, the question, though, essentially. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so, so yeah, I was kind of talking about the, the way all these things interact with one another lo logistically. Um, yeah, so basically we, we get all of the data from MIGSI in on these menus over here, and then you have the ability from there to send those to any of this other stuff. Uh, so the stuff, in short, is kind of management for the external audio input, which in our case is usually a trumpet. Um, <laughs> a couple of kind of synthesis voices uh, of our own devising, these, these three things here all make kind of gnarly, chaotic sounds. Uh, a couple of different granular processors, a delay, a mixer to kind of combine all the stuff together. So just like a basic set of synthesis and processing tools that all worked well together and sounded good together, but that we could still get a kind of reasonable range of results out of. Um, anyway, modulation in between all of these different uh, devices within the application is handled on all of these blue menus. So you have access there to all of the items that come in on these buses over here. And you also have access to other internal modulation sources. So there's yet another page of different modulation sources, LFOs, random sources, sample and holds, um, control mixers, things like that. And a whole other page of kind of pulse generation stuff which is something more like uh, in a modular synth, how you'd think of like a trigger or a gate uh, as opposed to a control voltage. Uh, we do basically distinguish between those things in this app, uh, if only for the sake of not having menus that have like, you know, 200 different items in them. Uh, anyway, so that's kind of a general overview of how the app is organized, so you have the ability to get sound in, you have the ability to get data in, it makes its own sound, it can process sounds, uh, you have the ability to store presets so that you can kind of get back to an idea later once everything's mm. <laughs> kind of That was old. a big one. Yeah, well it is, and it made it such that we could, you know, actually make, make pieces yeah. uh, using this. Yeah. Um, and make yeah. pieces that had varied sections to them. I so mean, for anyone who plays a modular synth, like you know that struggle when you <laughs> make the perfect patch and then is that it? Like do you never touch that instrument again? I mean, come on. <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> so this was a, this was a really amazing thing because we were kind of bringing in the, the like utility and the ease of, um, prototyping and auditioning ideas that we could have with the modular, but we also had the ability to store a huge number of like snapshots of the program so that even within a one show, I could change states, I could go through 12, 15 different, basically instrument definitions. Um, so yeah, that was a really big, <laughs> big thing. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can. Uh, so that actually conveniently, no, 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 you jumped <laughs> only like two seconds ahead, so, <laughs> so, so we're good. Um, so yeah, so you know, we made this app, we made a lot of cool, fun pieces with it, and then we had this kind of burning desire to see what we could do now that we had better tactics for handling all of the data from, from MIGSI to control other stuff. Uh, because we we own modular synthesizers and we're we're computer musicians, so we're used to using OSC. Uh, so we did develop ways to kind of get the data out of this application and into others. 
Uh, so Sarah is gonna, gonna play an example of how we have at some point or another used um, OSC, open sound control, um, which is like a MIDI-like protocol. It's a little yeah. different um, to, to do cool stuff with Migsy. And I think this was before, um, I'm sorry, I wish I mm. knew how to avoid it. <laughs> No, it don't, it's, it's not okay. your fault. Okay, I'll try to be very still. Um, <laughs> okay, it's hard to be still. I'm a very animated talker. Um, anyways, I'm not going to worry about it. So this was before, I, I believe this was before we even tried interfacing MIGSY with modulars for the yeah. first time. What we did, uh, so we both, um, this project started at CalArts, which is just north of here by about 30 minutes. Um, that's where we met, and that's where we spent all of our sleepless weeks and months soldering things together and attempting to <laughs> make things communicate. Um, and so there is a classroom at CalArts that is called the Machine Lab that has a bunch of mechatronic drum, like percussion instruments hanging from the ceiling that have been designed by um, a few people. Um, one of the one of the faculty members there, Ajay Kapoor, and um, a colleague of his named Trimpin, and then also over the years, a number of his and of their students in the in the music technology department there. Um, and so these instruments are all addressable either by MIDI or OSC. So our first kind of experiment, and this is literally the first that you're about to watch this video. So. It's a little rough around the edges. It's just like a phone video. Um, was using MIGSY, and you can see there's no microphone input, so it's all sensor and gesture based to control this room full of drums. I was very happy. Yeah, so that was <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so the reason why we wanted to show you that video, for a number of reasons, it's pretty cool. It's a rare um, set of instruments up there, so it was a pretty incredible experience to get to work with them. But also, um, there's something about, you can kind of see me like figuring it out as that clip goes on. Um, because that was really just the process. Like we got these things firing and connecting and then we were like, let's see what happens. And thankfully Ryan decided to pull the, his phone out and film, which is so cool now, years later, yeah, looking yeah. back on it. But you can kind of see that I'm like, oh, it does that. I'm kind of learning the interactions as we go just in the span of this like little two minute clip. So, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, anyway, so we, we wanted very quickly to be able to do those sort of things, to be able to control modular synthesizers, to find all these, uh, all these different sorts of, of interactions. Um, and that kind of takes us to, to another part of the conversation and to some demonstrations. Um, so we've, we've got a quote up here by, by Don Buchla, who I assume you, you know about. He was a, a pretty brilliant fella. He's commonly considered to be one of the first people to invent a modular synthesizer. That's kind of a weird thing. Um, but anyway, around the, in the 1980s, he started making these really fascinating instruments that used a combination of digital and analog technology. Um, and were not themselves modular instruments. He made like these weird self-contained synths called the uh, Touche 400 and 800, or 700. And uh, they were really cool. And, and for me, a lot of his ideas became far more interesting at this point because it was no longer a situation where he was developing instruments module by module and then having things kind of fit together. Instead, these were like really full, thoroughly considered instruments in their own right that weren't made in the same way of this kind of like, kind of patchwork of, of components. Anyway, around that time, he started doing a lot of interviews really to promote sales of the 400 and has just had these incredible profound things to say about what uh, what an electronic instrument is and why it's significantly different from an acoustic instrument. And his basic explanation is that it kind of boils down to language. Um, language in his case meant that uh, for any acoustic instrument, the means of uh, sound production and the means of controlling the instrument are intrinsically related. Uh, is that, maybe that's me doing all that. No, 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 it's okay. Um, anyway, that is to say a trumpet sounds like a trumpet because it is the shape that a trumpet is and is made of the materials that a trumpet is made of. You play it the way you play it because it has valves. Uh, and that's really all there is to the story. It's a physical object whose sound is completely dependent on the way that it is built and what it is physically. But electronic instruments aren't necessarily like that. They have some kind of input structure, some means of playing them. They have some means of generating sound. But those two things aren't necessarily directly related to one another the same way that they are on a saxophone or a guitar. Um, and that adds all of this extra fertile territory for exploring new types of things that the instrument could do. And I think we've found throughout our own work that the really exciting stuff that we've done isn't so much about like making cool sounds and wasn't so much about making a good input interface, but finding cool ways to connect those two things to one another. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, in that particular setup, I think it would have been pretty similar. Yeah, um, Paul, Paul asked if. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supposed to, right. There's. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> asked if um, in that video we just played, if it were played a second time, played the same way, would the results have yeah. been the same from the drums? Yeah, and I guess I think in that particular setup it would have been similar. It would not have been note for note, rhythm for rhythm, the same. Um, the, but net effect the net effect would have been, been the same. same. Now, that was still pretty early on before we had gotten into a lot of the kind of more, um, I don't know, nuanced mapping strategies that we're going to be talking about tonight in particular. We hadn't quite gotten there yet. Not that there was anything wrong with what we were doing at that point either, but w it could get a lot deeper. <laughs> um, yeah. So... I guess uh, the first thing to say is that early on, whenever we got stuff really working uh, right at first, and whenever we first started building this kind of general purpose application that we're using, um, you're always tempted to do really kind of dumb stuff first. Uh, you're tempted to you know, map the pitch of oscillators directly to the position of your valves. And it's fun, it's cool that you see that it works, but it, in the end, it's like, 
kind of like not musically that satisfying and it gets really old to listen to pretty quickly. And another thing about this quote and what Ryan just said in particular is that that total independence between input and output, while it may exist for electronic instruments, it doesn't exist for acoustic instruments, right? So if you do a very direct one-to-one -one mapping with a valve, for example, where every time you push it down, it goes guess what happens? I mean, you probably have pieced it together. You all of a sudden have to decide if you want to play the trumpet or the oscillator, right? The, the two are no longer compatible. And so your brain gets divided between like technician mode and like musician mode and it's, it's no, it's not fun. It's not fun. It's not musically enriching. So, um, yeah, the, this this quote in particular, when I first read it, was very, very it kind of had a big impact on me because I was like, wow, there's so much potential. Like, why does input have to go to output directly? You know, or at all? Like, why can't it go around the corner? 16 times, turn back on itself, split into five, and then go to output, because it can in the electronic music world. But the really challenging thing is that the trumpet will still always be there vibrating and resonating as an acoustic trumpet. So it's always about finding this like kind of dancing on that line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so a lot of our, really I think the bulk of our work making MIGSY wasn't so much about getting getting sensors strapped onto a trumpet and wasn't so much about figuring out how to m make a cool sounding patch on a synthesizer but has been more about finding ways to like sufficiently screw up the data that comes yeah. out of the interface to the point where it itself is kind of musically interesting and generating results based on the input that are not directly the input. Um, so yeah, do you wanna do you wanna talk about yeah is it some some of that business? Yeah, sure. So let me make let me get this. I think so. So is your question that do we want it to be like repeatable or something like that every time? Okay, yeah, so the question is, do we want to be able to, yeah, replicate things from piece to piece, performance to performance? Um, um, that's a great question, actually, and something that we, we definitely should address. Um, for us, the answer is probably closer to yes, but no, um, and I can explain what I mean. Um, <laughs> some kind of repeatability is necessary, I think. It's absolutely necessary so that when you pick up the instrument, you don't feel like you ha you're starting from scratch. Like you have some familiarity, you understand this type of input gesture will yield this type of response, you know? Um, but the precise, exact replication is not something that is has ever been super interesting to us. We're more motivated by um, systems and mapping strategies that are like a little bit screwy, like things that um, are kind of by nudging one part of it, there's a trickle effect and you're gonna start to cause a little bit of chaos or, mm -hmm. or random artifacts that you didn't anticipate start to emerge, well, things like that. Yeah, and the best part in, uh, of something like that and the reason I think that's been of a primary interest to us is that, that we're really both improvisers yeah. uh, to, to a big extent. Absolutely. And not knowing exactly what's going to happen is, is way more interesting in that context because it gives you much more to react to. Um, and I think in, in the best situations, playing with Migsy is a matter of like, just playing the trumpet and kind of listening, listening to what your, your improv partner is giving back to you. It just so happens that the improv partner is, is a computer or, or a synthesizer. Um, and then that inspires you to interact with that musically in a different way without really having to think about what the sensors are doing. Just think about you know, what yeah. sound you would want to use to respond. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, oh, sorry, yeah, hello. I, sometimes, I, I like to talk about it less as a duet and more like a two-headed monster. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna turn on some sound here for a second and um, just, ooh. 
Maybe you can mute this mic, because there's a lot of mics and a little bit of ringing. I'm just going to try to, hopefully this will be okay for the live stream, but, um, or maybe you can, I'm just going to try to, hopefully take over, but basically I'm going to just show you a couple of these ways that we have not, over, but um, basically I'm going to just show you, oh, there, it's there, it's going, there's like a delay, there's an echo. Great, thank you. Um, very demanding hearing. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you a few of the things that I have set up in this patch right now, and then we'll just walk you through some of these strategies as we kind of stumble stumble through them. So something that we we love to do that's very simple is we use the um, force sensitive resistors, the pressure sensors on either side of the valves, um, to basically trigger to like randomize things in the patch. And that's a really fun way to kind of just suddenly nudge something or launch something, it's not always delicate, into entirely new territory. Um, so instead of, you know, uh, I can give you an example of this. And for this, we're using these, um, these synthesis engines here, which are deeply chaotic, very feedback driven um, oscillators. So let me get this back up and running while we're here. Okay. <laughs> What I have here, you'll, you'll see on the screen behind me when I start to, if I apply some pressure with my thumb here, um, everything just kind of goes bonkers. But what it's doing is it's basically triggering that, that button that is randomizing all the parameters on this oscillator. And so every time I do it, this, is, this speaks to my kind of yes but no, mostly no, is that I know that every time I engage this part of my hand, something is gonna happen. And I know, I have played this instrument now for years, so I know the character of these oscillators, so I kind of can anticipate what it'll be like, but I don't know exactly what it's gonna do, ever. And that's the cool part, is because I always have to be, I always have to be really attentive and listening and really have my ears out in the corner, corners of the rooms, you know? Because some things will happen so quickly, and if I move and I let go, it's gone. So there's always this moment of like, what if it's the perfect thing, you know? and you want to kind of latch on to it. Um, just kind of expanding on this a little bit, something that we learned <coughs> very early on through trial and error is that you can use data from one sensor and you can extract, depending on how you're scaling it and processing it, you can extract a lot of really meaningful information from it. So one pressure sensor that has continuous data can be used a as continuous information, like sweeping something. For example, if you wanted to use it to um, like dial in the amount of reverb or delay on a sound or something like that, right? Um, but in this application, it's, it's being used as a momentary, kind of like a switch, right? It's just saying on or off. And the way that we did that was we created um, over here in the data like scaling side of MIGSI, the ability to set up thresholds. And that's what these little 0.2 and 0.8 um, boxes are. Those are definable thresholds. So if you can see, that little red dot is jumping back and forth, basically to let us know where we are in the threshold, which is just basically like a division of the total sensor. Yeah, and value. basically, yeah, that gives us the ability to take continuous control sources and use them to trigger events. If you're a modular sound person or an electronics person, this is very much like using a Schmidt trigger or a comparator to, to initiate events uh, from continuous signals. Uh, and we're just doing that basically with all of the sensors all the time. So we have the ability all the to <laughs> all the sensors. The ability to monitor to use the the actual continuous data or to abstract it into yeah. this other type of information that's based on the raw data that the yeah. sensor itself produces. Yeah. So um, you know the temptation can be like, oh, I want 45 sensors on my thing. But once you realize that one sensor can be 
45 things, all of a sudden, it, you know, you, you, it, you don't need as much. You really don't need as many sources. Um, something else that um, I have set up here that's pretty simple but nice to think about is um, the direction of thresholds and how that can be mapped to create either like momentary switches or more like latching events that linger. So um, right now when I push my this thumb, when, I, uh, when it receives the ascending threshold, so the onset, it turns on. And then when I let go, it, has, it receives the descending threshold, going back down, right? What goes up must come down, and it turns off. Um, now over on the other oscillator, I have it set up so that it can be latching, so I can move, move on and do other things. Now, I'm going to turn it off for a second so I can talk, and I'll explain something, and then I'll keep going. <laughs> it's very rude. <laughs> okay, so um, the way that I have it set up here is that if you look here, this is hard to decode because this is like jumping inside of Ryan in my brain here, but um, thumb threshold 1A means thumb threshold 1 ascending, you know, and so that's the bottom threshold. Thumb threshold 1D is descending and so on and so forth. So index threshold 1A, index threshold 2. Okay, so what I have this set up as right now is that on the bottom threshold, as long as it doesn't go up past the top, it will turn on and stay, and then I can re-trigger things, and they will remain latching. Okay? And then, if, if I want to turn it off, what I have to do is really engage with the instrument and hold, go past threshold two, which is something that you learn just by playing. It's the same way that you, when you pick up your violin, you know, um, I am not a violin player, but you know, you just understand where these notes are, right? Or the fact that, you know, if I said sing a high note, now sing a lower note, you would kind of be able to do it because you understand your vocal cords. So it's the same type of intuition. So I can engage with it this way. I'm gonna turn down a little bit. Um, I can continue to trigger it and have these latching things. Meanwhile, over here I can have these momentary things. And then if I really dig in, it'll change once more quite nice actually and then it won't be until I let go and I finally release that it releases because it's it's catching that descending threshold so that's all coming from one sensor and so that's just an example and we apply this everywhere in the app um, but that this was a bit this took us a long time to figure out <laughs> a lot of very um, awkward patches and attempts to, to kind of control things. And there would be times when I would be on stage and I'd be like, I can't turn it off, I can't make it stop. You know, like it would just go and go and go. So it was a lot of fine tuning, um, <laughs> for sure, over many years. You have a question? That, that in, in this case, is based on a, a musical decision. So it, it's set up that way right now, but in another patch, we could set it up so that you, know, you don't have to breach past that, that higher threshold. Yeah. Um, basically, we've set it up so that you, to the extent of our own purposes, we can uh, create any kind of interaction between the device and the, the internal synthesis sources. So you can choose for, uh, you know, for the FSR to act as a, a like a, a toggle, or you can choose for it to act more like a momentary button, or you can choose for it to act more like a knob, mm -hmm. or, or something like that, or any combination of those things at once for, for different parts yeah. of the application. Yeah, and the, the reason why we have come toward this type of mapping is because there, like, I, I crave like a physical interaction with the instruments that I'm playing. And a lot of the time with electronic instruments, they aren't as physical, certainly not as, the f as physical as the trumpet. So I want to feel like when I'm digging into something and I'm trying to get to this like higher threshold that I can only get to if I'm really engaged with the instrument, I want that to have a meaningful musical result, you know? Um, and so a lot of the time what we do is we use these upper thresholds um, to, to kind of 
yeah, create that like visceral kind of physical engagement that I, I want to have with the horn. Um, and we often use the highest, most intense threshold actually to create moments of calm or to get things to be silent, which might be a little backwards from what you, you might think. Like you dig into something and it goes crazy, but um, we really, um, and again, this is just a personal choice. Um, it's like the, the, the kind of default tendency of electronic instruments is to make sound. As long as there's power and, they, and you give them something to do, they'll, they'll chortle away, you know, and they'll make sound. Acoustic instruments are the complete opposite. Unless you inject them with energy, they're just gonna lie there and look at you, make you feel bad for not practicing. Um, <laughs> and so we, we wanted, again, to walk, to dance this line between the acoustic and the electronic world. We wanted to get, to make it so that you had to like hold on to the electronic sound. And if you let go, it stops. Like it just, it's like, I'm done, you know? So that was, that was a, yeah, a choice that we kind of make. Mm -hmm. And it's not always like that. It's piece, piece by piece. Yeah, or um, section of a piece. Or section by section. Right. Yeah. Do you want to maybe jump a little bit maybe out of Migsy and talk about the, the audio oh, input? Oh, yeah, 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 totally. I, th I think, think we can do that within reason. Uh, cool, so we're gonna move away from this application for a second and we're, we'll, we'll come back to it for some cool sounds. Um, but uh, lately we've been using uh, yet another thing made in Max uh, that's loosely based on, on a couple of, of Buchla's instruments, namely the, the 400 and the Touche. Uh, just to kind of show you that there are other ways of doing kind of similar detection of information from an instrument that don't require you to like build a whole thing that mm -hmm. you attach to your, your don't instrument. require sensors or anything like that um, if you're if you're smart with your mapping and you make a uh, sufficient structure for things to control then you can get a lot out of really simple input uh, which is kind of like what we're saying with this like randomization thing like really randomizing those oscillators in in the migsy patch uh, only takes essentially the equivalent of pressing a button and you got a lot of really rich animated kind of uh, intense sound. So just by building a process that survives randomization well and that can accept minimal input and still produce complex output, we're able to kind of free up musical bandwidth in the performer to be able to just focus on playing the instrument, send simple information along to a patch and then let the patch itself do some of the magic. Um, so we, we have a short demonstration here with some of the stuff you can do with just an envelope follower and a comparator, which are pretty common tools in synthesis, right? Um, you know, again, if you're a modular synth person, you well may have these, uh, and if you don't, uh, they're, they're pretty <laughs> easy to get and built into a million different devices. So if, if you don't know, an envelope follower is a device that's basically meant to take sound as an input and produce a control message of sorts as an output that's based on the loudness of the input signal. So the louder the input sound, the higher the, the voltage that comes out of your envelope follower. This is really common in like uh, really like kind of cheesy guitar effects, like the dynamic wah effect, the wah that opens as you play harder. Um, is, is based on this. That's really just like a filter that's being controlled by an envelope follower. Anyway, so if you use an envelope follower, which is basically producing a signal based on how loud you're playing, and then run the output of that device into a comparator, which is a device that uh, produces kind of like a trigger or gate signal based on a certain threshold being exceeded, then you can kind of do this crude thing where you're able to detect articulations. So you can say like, okay, I'm here playing quietly, you know, envelope is kind of chortling along down below the threshold, nothing gets triggered. But the instant that you play something loudly and you exceed that threshold, you can set other processes into motion with that. So this here is uh, just taking control from nothing except the audio coming in. Uh, we're using a different horn that doesn't have any electronics on it, uh, just to As prove proof. that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, 
and yeah, basically every time it detects uh, a kind of onset, a whole bunch of stuff is put into motion. Um, more than just you know opening up a filter, but randomizing all sorts of things, telling different sequences to play, and all kinds of stuff. So uh, Sarah, have have at this it. This is actually what I was playing at the very beginning too. This is oh, the yeah. same setup. I was on the flute thing, valve oil. <laughs> It adds to it, you know. So that was just a short little demonstration that you know y you really can get varied interactions without needing really complex input methods. Uh, so if you have a computer, if you have even like a very simple modular setup, it, odds are if you're really smart about the way you use your modulation sources and you relate different parts of your setup to one another, you can make a playing style that, that results in very, uh, I don't yeah. know, things that kind of spiral outward from very simple actions. Surprising things. And if anyone wants, if there's anyone out here who, is there anyone out there who's really interested in the mapping strategies, particularly the, the separation between input and output, there is the more recent NIME paper from yeah. 2019, um, which I, I think is called Perspectives on Time and then some kind of long, rambly title like Mapping Strategies with MIGZ. But if you go into the NIME archive or you Google it, you'll find it. And that gets into a lot of very specific ideas and approaches um, that kind of are similar to all of this. Um, I think I see some burning questions. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so um, basically, that that patch, it, um, what we just, what Sarah just played was a patch that's. It basically is a polyphonic synthesizer. It's twelve voices, um, divided into two groups of six voices that each have their own independent timbre settings. Um, so basically, every time an onset was detected from the audio input, it was randomizing selected parameters for each of those kind of independent synthesizers and was simultaneously uh, telling this kind of event generator to go, which is like kind of like a sequencer or arpeggiator, but a little bit m more random or stochastic. Um, so, so basically, every time uh, this like trigger was detected, it was basically saying, okay, event generator, go and randomize a lot of stuff. Um, so it's simultaneously putting all of these uh, voices in the synthesizer into motion, telling them to start making sound, but also altering the way they sound with every new note. Uh, a little bit of delay. Yeah, there, there is delay and reverb, but no, otherwise it was all just synthesized. Yeah, and additionally for that, that uh, we were, uh, 
at the same time as we're randomizing all of this uh, internal stuff in the computer, we're sending out control voltages to, to our, our Buchla system. Um, oh yeah, so we didn't talk about that. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of mixed in with the we, rest we of the chaos. <laughs> we got so excited about everything else that we forgot to say that, yeah, after the robot drums, we, we did, what we did was we built in a CV, like a control voltage output into the MIGSI app, and that <laughs> launched us into the whole, n the next new chapter of our life, which was interfacing MIGSI with modular synths. And so, yes, everything you're hearing, sorry, we goofed, is the laptop, but it's also the Buchla synth that's sitting here that we're not touching because we're controlling it through the trumpet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some other questions. I think you, you maybe were first. So you're 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 asking basically if like in the course of all of this randomization something cool happens <laughs> that we want to kind of stick with or jive with in various ways if we can hold on to that, and the answer is that uh, at least in this application with the type of setup we're using right now, not really very easily without reaching over the, the computer and changing some things. Really, this particular patch was made to be played with a MIDI controller more so than it was to be played with external audio sources. Um, and at the point you're using it that way, you can kind of do uh, slightly more controlled stuff like this, or like yeah. that. But we really wanted to demonstrate something that, you know, a lot of the time when we show off, when we talk about MIGSI, there's a response that's kind of like, yeah, okay, but I don't have a trumpet covered in sensors. And so we just really wanted to show you kind of a side of the world, like something that is very MIGSI adjacent that still, you know, has been kind of achieves a similar sound world that only requires one, one input source, and that input source is a mic. So you could do it with your voice or anything. Um, I was, go um, if you're all down with this, I was gonna <laughs> jump back over to the MIGSI app and maybe play a little bit in there, because we haven't actually listened to that very much. And then I think, I know there's a couple other questions, but maybe we can do a Q&A yeah. after that, if that's cool. Okay, so give me a second to, Dance with some windows. Um, I don't think I need this anymore. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, so just for, for full transparency, that, um, that thing that happened at the very end was a complete surprise. It was beautiful, like that, like me doing that gesture and revealing that granular texture was not something that I was expecting at all. Um, and I understand why it happened, but it's like a kind of a beautiful sort of accident. And those are the moments that I live for as an improviser and um, are really like baked into the ethos of why why Migsy is the way it is. Anyway, um, you want to come back? <laughs> I didn't even, <laughs> I thought you were still, it makes sense you weren't there the entire time. Oh, no, um, so we've come to the end of this presentation, but what I want to say is, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Yes. Um, if anyone has questions or wants to just chat more or learn more about what we do, send us an email. We're very easy to find. My email is just Sarah Bellareed at gmail, e email me anytime. Um, and we're gonna do a Q&A now at this point. Okay. Um, but I also wanna mention before you leave that if you are, if you loved what you heard today, there are some um, records right there, CDs, they're not records, available, which is the first CD that was ever recorded of using Migsy. So it's a big milestone album for us personally and it's also my first album period. So that's a lots of milestones. It's right there. Um, if you're interested. Okay, questions. Here we go. I think you first. Go for it. Sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I wondered if this question would come up. Uh, we've been asked if we sell this technology, and the answer is that it, at this moment it works really well for us, but I don't know if it's at a state right now where it would work great for other people. Uh, the further answer is that we would very much love to and are kind of working to get it to that point, but we're just not there quite yet. Uh, but yeah, keep, keep in touch if you're <laughs> interested. Yeah. No, actually, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah. that question just for the folks who are on the live stream was um, if we've done any work or thought about tying the MIGSI technology to visual applications. Mm -hmm. um, we have done a little bit of experimenting with it, um, yes, and it's totally possible because any program that receives OSC or, you know, serial data or MIDI is off to the races, yeah. but Ryan and I, neither of us are really visual programmers, so we've done a little bit though. Yeah, we've tinkered yeah. in processing and, mm -hmm. and P5JS, yeah. kind of getting cool stuff going, but um, it'd be great to collaborate with someone that, that does yeah. that uh, to totally. a greater extent than we do. Do you have a question up front? <laughs> it's a good yeah. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Yeah, the suggestion has come that we we <laughs> let people have this app, and and if you're interested in this stuff, this one's a little a little clunky, I think, for most applications. But just reach out to us. We yeah, have plenty yeah, yeah. Plenty like of, I said, plenty just of email us. We'd be glad to share. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can't manage this. Yeah, Trevor, <laughs> Trevor. Yeah, is there someone and on then the stream? Behind. Oh, okay, so the question is if we've tried using contact mics in the instrument. Um, Migsy, the design of Migsy does not involve contact mics, but um, there are a lot of other instruments, um, probably I'd say slightly smaller endeavors that we have embarked on that are contact mic um, focused <laughs> in particular. So although we don't have any of them here tonight, um, we could, we would love to share them with you as well, again, if you contact us. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you're interested in, like, the, the software or other weird little instruments or stuff, uh, you can email gradientinstruments at gmail.com. Uh, gradient. gradient, like, gradient. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that was not helpful. Yeah. <laughs> like a color gradient. Gradient, that, like gradient. Yeah. And that, yeah. that'll come to both of us, mm -hmm. and that's just kind of the email that we've sectioned off for that sort of stuff. Those are, like, stuff. any kind of noisy, chaotic 
basically like this, um, these types of things, but in hardware form and, yeah. and stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to repeat the question. So the question was that the, um, when the effect turns off on the force sensitive resistor, essentially, it's actually um, not at the very top, but it's on the moment of release. Um, basically, yeah, there's the upper threshold zone that we define, um, and it's basically you just learn it by muscle memory. So at the beginning, I was accidentally triggering things and turning things off left, right, and center, but it was, which, and I know some of you are probably like, why don't you just put a different button to turn it off? But having it all like right there in my hands is such a cool thing. Um, and so you just learn it over time with the muscle memory. So it's not quite a, um, like a dead zone per se, but there, there is this upper threshold that you can only get to when you're really yeah. Working and hard. you can you can define like how difficult that is. Yeah, to reach totally. As well, you can so. change those thresholds. It's just that it's w you know the easier it is to reach the upper threshold, the easier it is to accidentally <laughs> trigger it, right? Uh, the oh, the accelerometer. Um, so yeah, the we accelerometer actually that. wasn't used at all. Yeah. So yeah. the, the answer, the question was if there's a lag with the accelerometer. There isn't. It's really quite amazingly responsive. Yeah. But in this particular patch, we weren't using it. <laughs> we were just using valve data. And um, the basically, we were monitoring the velocity of the valve. So not necessarily if they were pressed or down or how far, but how, how quickly they were flying on the horn. Um, and hand, front and back discrete hand tension on the FSRs. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so for, for a lot of the things that we're doing, we very seldom, like, directly map a sensor to any, like, particular very obvious destination. Usually, instead, we're running it through a series of other processes that kind of obfuscate that relationship a little bit more. So generally, like, something we've been trying a lot lately is, yeah, de detecting the velocity of, of, of motion, like, basically detecting how yeah. quickly a valve is being pressed or how frequently a valve is being pressed. And doing that type of computation inherently has to have a lag because you have to compare the past to the present. Oh, yeah, true. That um, might have been what you were seeing, yeah. Yeah. Um, a Andy? <laughs> Hmm, good observation. So the question was about the sample, the kind of the things that sounded, they weren't samples. Well, they yeah, were kind of samples. Yeah. Okay, so the question was about the sample bank, like what was going on there, if it was random or how that was working. So there's a couple answers to the question. One is um, everything I was playing was going into a very long delay with quite high feedback in the delay line, so it was lasting for a while. Um, it was also vari a, a variable delay. I have a fluctuating random uh, voltage that's going in and, and modulating the delay size slightly so that there's some waiver. That's why it kind of had that like old dying tape deck sound a little bit. Um, so that's some of what you're hearing, and it's such a long delay that it could very well be a matter of seconds before some of the material comes back. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that you might have been hearing is, was the granular processor, which was this up here. And it has basically an open recording buffer, and it's constantly listening to what I'm doing and then chopping it up into pieces. And, yeah. and, and, and that also records. It, the granular processor has kind of like a feedback control, so you can record its own output yeah. back into its input. So you really can hear things resurface well after they originally happened. Yeah. And then I was, I was interacting with the granular processor um, in a very indirect way, but I was basically able to nudge it into new territory. So it might, pr it might be functioning like in one mode, and then based on what the two chaotic oscillators are doing, it would randomize the granular processor by a s just by a, a kind of a trickle effect. Yeah. Um, and so then it would have a totally new character. Yeah, great question. Yes. Mm 
Yeah, so uh, you asked uh, in, in the other setup where we're kind of triggering events from detecting sound, essentially detecting the loudness of signals, if you could do similar kinds of detection for, for frequency. And you definitely can. Um, and depending on how you do it, it could be really cool. Uh, depending on how you do it, it could also be kind of like uh, not, not as fun. And I think the way... Yeah, exactly. It, yeah, something random, or maybe like if you're using pitch in order to like somehow nudge along other processes, that that could be really cool. But um, it's also really easy when you start doing that to get into territory where you're like just kind of making the electronics behave like a trumpet, and the trumpet's already plenty good at, at <laughs> behaving like a trumpet. And if you want a trumpet to sound like a synthesizer, there are easier ways to <laughs> to do it. Uh, you, I think you had a, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and th like what you're describing there, this kind of like conditional behavior of sensors based on one another's activity is totally possible with the stuff we already have. Like we could totally make it such that the valves do one thing whenever an FSR isn't depressed, yeah. but when it is depressed, they do something else. Oh um, yeah, yeah, not with not with the other trumpet. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. But totally, yeah, yeah it, something as simple as like a MIDI foot pedal or anything could, yeah, totally do that sort of thing. At the back, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I want to see. I'm so happy someone <laughs> asked that question. Um, it's, I mean, it's very, it takes a couple minutes. I'll do it in a moment if you want to watch. Um, but basically, um, for those who are curious, what we did is we went, I, I went to a rubber factory and I brought them this trumpet mute. So trumpet mutes used to be made with cork. It's very convenient that I just happen to have these here. Anyway, um, I thought I was going to use them to play, but it's a good demo. They used to be made with cork. They're typically not made with cork anymore. They're typically made with this like foamed, um, neoprene. Neoprene, essentially like a foamed rubber. And what happens is you stick it in the bell of the trumpet, and as long as there's a little bit of humidity, it sticks like there's no tomorrow. Like it's just in there. Um, and so we thought, well, this is great. What if we can make use the same material to stick Migsy onto the horn? So I brought them this mute, and they're like, oh yeah, this is the blah 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 blah. And they gave me the technical term. And then I bought like, I somehow managed to convince a wholesale rubber factory to give me like one square foot of it. I don't understand. <laughs> they thought I was crazy. They took me on a whole tour of the factory. They were very generous. It's like, okay, I'd like one foot, please. Um, and, and that's what we lined Migsy with. I don't know. We just got to go after it, you know, go after your dreams. Um, so that's all that it is. There's no um, hooks or anything. It just, it's just held on by friction. And then the handguard is Velcro and it just wraps around. Um, and a, the, the wi couple of wires that need to connect are on, um, just have little pin headers and you just stick them in and then the battery. And so that's it. So it's really kind of like a three step, one, two, three, off in about a minute and a half. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so the question was, have, I, have we used a, like a wah-wah pedal or something with the flugelhorn setup in particular? Um, and the answer, I guess, is truthfully no. Um, um, Migsy and the Migsy app world came first, and then it was a lot more recently that we started to work on these other software apps that would use audio input. And um, yeah, the whole pedal world is something that I haven't really gotten into, probably because I've been so <laughs> preoccupied with <laughs> sensors and uh, modular synths and everything, but it's absolutely a great, you know, trumpet and pedals, any instrument and pedals are yeah. a great pairing, so it's a good thing to explore. Yeah. Any other questions, or have we sufficiently tired you out? Yeah. Oh, thank you for asking. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Okay, so I am just going to take a moment here to shamelessly promote while well, you asked. Um, on Mar <laughs> you asked. On March 25th, so just in a bit over a month, 
I am premiering a very big and exciting new work up at CalArts. Um, and Ryan is going to be performing, and it's actually an ensemble work. I'm kind of awkwardly referring to it as an electroacoustic chamber opera with lots of fixed media and augmented instruments. So if you can kind of imagine what that might be like, but Migsy is involved. <laughs> There's going to be um, a whole lot of this modular stuff for sure. People playing incredible contrabass quarter tone flutes, um, really astonishingly beautiful vocalists. And yeah, and so that's March 25th and it's a free concert. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it'll be at eight o'clock, I think. And it's up at CalArts in the Wild Beast. So when you drive in, it's the first concert hall that's right on the left. And I definitely would love you all to be there. And I warmly invite you to come and celebrate this premiere with us. It's the kind of piece um, that <laughs> probably won't be played again for a while because it takes, it, it's, a, it's a huge group of people and a huge group of tech, and all of the audio is in, quad, is in quadraphonic sound, so it takes a specific type of concert hall as well in order to make it happen. So yes, please save the date. You're cordially invited, March 25th. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, is that it? Cool. Awesome. Okay. Thank great. you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. So much. Have a great <laughs> night.